Greetings in the name of the Most High God. May the Lord bless and keep you throughout all your days, and may he be your guiding lamp, and you will not go astray, but you will have good success. Praise the Lord, Jesus Christ, the Creator, Yahweh, the one, the one true God, the I Am, that there is no other but I Am. The love that he has given us is like a seed that's planted and produces love. One of the first aspects of loving is forgiveness and produces forgiveness so that even though one may take a stand and be considered unloving by the world and agreeing to take flack or persecution for one's faith while loving them who persecute you, this is Christ. And that's, it's really very simple. It's not difficult, but that, it's got to be real. But that love that is born in us, because a natural man will hate those who hate him and love those who, who love him. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, so what good is that? Love the ones who are your enemies and hate no one. And I, and I know that this is kind of a message for now, and I was going to go ahead and put some of this to uh, uh, Scripture. Um, every Christian, every Bible-believing follower of Jesus, Yeshua, Everyone on the path who is on the path. Everyone who is twice born, that is, born again, meaning your eyes are open to what the world really is, not what they tell you it is, not what they put on television what it is. But you see the world for what it is. You see humanity for what we are, depraved. And in this, I agree with all the theologians, pretty much, who have spoken about the scriptures that man exists despite himself with all his best efforts is totally depraved. He will, given the nature of his depravity, and if you wanted me to prove that, I'd say just look at disease. Disease is a direct result of depravity of agreement with sin. All disease is. We're not imperfectly made. We were perfectly made. And there would be no disease and no death if there were not sin, period. So man obviously has something to do with his own uh, result, which is sickness and ultimately death. Uh, I don't think anyone, you know, you can be a saint, of course, meaning a follower of Christ, you know, a sinner that is forgiven, and still succumb to a disease. We all do. I mean, at the end, they, the disease is the, the bugs win. The bugs end up killing us, you know, from dust to dust until the resurrection. I firmly believe in the resurrection because I've already experienced it, at least in my memory and in the spirit. So I know it exists. I'm not imagining it. I know the eternal state exists, in other words. I'm not imagining it. Because I do exist somehow in the eternal realm, and so do you, but we just can't access it right now because we're going through this. We're going through this because it's God's good pleasure to put us through this because I believe what he's doing is he's harvesting the love that is in us growing up as seeds for when one is twice born, uh, the proof of which comes in the loving of one's enemies for real, not just saying, oh, I love you, brother. I have so many people say, I love you, brother, to me, even though they want to, I know they want to take my head off. And... Um, and they just say it like a rote thing, almost hostile, almost as a hostility. 
you know, passive aggressive hostility. Oh, I love you, brother. And it's like, I don't, I don't get that. I don't feel that. You want to kill me, but you're saying that as a cover. I see you, buddy. Just say you hate me. You want to take my head off and be honest about it. You can't fake this stuff. Christness is planted within us via the Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin. And through this pain and suffering we go through, which is tremendous when you feel an amplified sense of guilt over everything you've done. When you have that amplified sense of guilt, what happens? You suffer pain. And you want to make retribution. You want to get the guilt off you. And the only way you can really do that and feel decent is you've got to forgive for real and just let all the grudges go. You're not going to do that until you've felt so much pain that it finally is broken within you and you're broken and you just give it up because you're broken. And then that produces, that's the production of love that the Lord is after. So with enough horror, and this world is pure horror, those who can see beyond the veil realize Oh my God, you better just keep that veil on. Just keep the illusion going, the grand illusion of Satan. Because if we were to see it full thrust, uh, you'd have mass suicide, planet-wide. If people knew when they signed on with the devil, nod, nod, wink, wink, doesn't really exist, um, for perks and <clears throat> jobs and to be connected and all that, when you do that, you don't think you're a murderer, do you? You don't think that you're doing anything wrong, do you? You think you've got kind of a secret thing going on and you know, you got a chance to really make good in this world, the world being your oyster, don't you? You think it's all about just finding a way to make things work, don't you? I was reminded of the Joe Walsh song, The Rocky Mountain Way, remember that? He said it was better than the way they had before. So I, what's he talking about? Bases are loaded, blah, blah, blah. You help me, I help you. You scratch my back, I scratch your back. Uh, yeah, baby. If the foo shit, I mean, if the, if the, if the shoe fits. <laughs> I would contend, Mr. Walsh, that if it, it may be seemingly better, but now that you're old and nobody cares, and no one remembers, and the fame and fortune is getting tarnished. Uh, you can have all the money in the world, but you can't buy one more day of life. I mean, you know, a lot of people are at peace with that. They go ahead and say, I did, I tore it up, I was a winner. I can die, happy man. I guess people can do that, sure. There are many calloused people. That, you, to do that, you, you're already dead inside. So being dead is just kind of confirming what you already are. So it's no big deal. That's the majority of people. They just go on into death because they're already dead. But that's not everybody. That's not everybody. And that's, um, you know, <clears throat> I hate to say this, but a lot of people who claim to be born again, a lot of people who claim to be Christian and claim to be a follower of Jesus, um, not many, but uh, quite a few, they're already dead anyway. You know, they're, they're, they just go, oh, I love you, brother. Ah, uh -huh. yeah, it's hostile. That's a hostile comment coming from you. Well, I love you too. I just love everybody. Now, I can really feel that love. That's real love. You, there's, a, there's a Christian PC, a Christian political correctness. And so they learn to say all the catchphrases. I love you, brother. Uh huh. Yeah. Right. What have you done for me lately? You love me. It's, you love me, unless I'm not going to help you. If I'm not going to help you, you hate me. So, ultimately. Obviously, what the Lord is doing is he's producing love, the kind of love like when I say I love you, brother, is for real, meaning though you might, might sin against me, I forgive you further than that. I love you because I can see your spirit. And, uh, you know, I love everything that because God made you, I love you. Because he loves you, I love you. But I'm not forcing it because it's coming from within me. 
because I'm broken, meaning those habits, I, I can't just hate like I used to because I'm just kind of traumatized here. So I got to get on this love train of Jesus. Otherwise, I'm going to just stay traumatized. And that's the only game in town. That's the only way I can go being, you know, I lost the game. So the only thing the world could do is just, you know, say, oh, poor guy, you kick me in the head. So the only thing available to me, being broken, being traumatized, and no one's going to begrudge me this. I choose Jesus. I choose to serve the Lord. I choose to be with God, even though the devil is trying every single day. The more that, you know, because of that status, every day I'm getting, um, you know, the opposite kind of dialogue in my head and the almost going back and forth like a ping pong match. And I get more of it when I talk to you as we as we're having this chat today so you know it's uh you say you want to go on that path with Christ but then it becomes uh, a real obstacle course because you have to try the spirits all the time because you don't know what's in your head giving you ideas you know uh, the, the rule of thumb is well if what you're getting is you know because the devil will try to uh, mimic God and say, you know, and get you to call him, you know, father and all that, thinking that you're speaking with the Lord. And, um, but if it, if it leads to your destruction or harm to another, it's not Yahweh. It's not Jesus, usually, you know, unless it's like, a, you know, but, but the Lord is not uh, uh, against Let's put it this way. War is a result of the human de depravity. It's always corrupt. You know, most always. So I guess a revolution of independence may or may not be corrupt. But, but most of it gets, you know, co-opted by corrupt forces. At the same time, the Lord does pick the winners and the losers. You know, he doesn't say, uh, I don't want war, um, or he would abolish it. So war is another manifestation of our depraved state. Poverty... Um, lack of goodwill, abject hatred, as we've seen this last week, uh, regarding the Chick-fil-A fiasco, which um, actually is no fiasco. It just shows uh, the enemy how many there are who um, suddenly awoke to the spirit and went down and got a Chick-fil-A sandwich when, when a brother was uh, in need. And that was really amazing to see. <laughs> That was, uh, you know, the guy basically, what did he say? The head of Chick-fil-A said um, he believes in it, in, in the, he believes in the Bible and the biblical view of marriage. And if people go against that and legalize gay marriage, he believes God's wrath will be on the nation. So he supports organizations that support traditional marriage. And that is called hate. And, and the, with our view and the way a Christian looks at it is, no, he knows he's getting flack, but he loves gays so much, he doesn't want to see them, you know, make stupid mistakes like getting co-opted by the, commu the commies, the left. Like the Democratic Party is now, I just call it the Communist Party. He doesn't want to get co-opted by the globalists, the New World Order, which is, which is all on the left. Well, you could say extreme right, too, and also the establishment Republicans are also all progressives and communists. You know, the whole, you know, it's totally corrupt. Communism is just a, it's just a state of corruption. Socialism is a state of corruption since it, it doesn't work. It's not of God. It's, it's of the enemy, which is why I speak out on it, because it's a, it's a spiritual manifestation of the depravity of man. So the gays have all lined up with the left, and they've always been with the left, figuring the left would make it, you know, can turn America into Sodom and Gomorrah, where they can have a nice playground, or, you know, where, where there's no guilt. Well, the only way there's, they're going to be happy as a political body is to force every kid to be sodomized in order to then, you know, and they, they, they will deny this, but it's like, well, how, how was anyone broken into homosexuality, you know, introduced by an uncle or, you know, forced through peer pressure, you know, a lot of things are like that. Um, I'm not talking about people who are just effeminate, that, and that there is that too. There are people born with um, 
gender conflicts and things like this. But what they're trying to do is make it okay. It's, it's not legal. Making marriage legal is just it, basically, it's got nothing to do with gay, you know, sex. It has to do with a bigger issue. And the gays are just useful idiots being used, and they don't know it, by these globalist forces that want to bring in their utopia. Uh, or the, I know what they want. I, I don't even know if I can explain. If I could explain this, I'd be a genius. If I could explain what's really going on and what I've seen since I spoke to you last, because um, I really did some deep thinking on this issue, and I really, then it finally became clear the, the whole issue about the gays and the um, environmentalism and all this stuff, uh, Occupy Wall Street and all those things, these are all just planks of the Communist Party. You know, of which the UN is communist. The, um, has fallen to communism as well as most, the, Europe has fallen to communism. And it's not, I'm not talking about people that wave a flag and say I'm a communist. I'm talking about the basic structure of uh, a top-down government control and tyranny of the people in exchange for doling out goodies which then get cut off like Stalin did as soon as they get a consensus. You know, not, the food stamp president, as soon as he gets a consensus, would cut off the food stamps because the money is supposed to go to the, to the elites while the rest of the world is enslaved. And basically the gays are caught up in a movement to create just that. In addition to, and I know, because I put myself in the place of being gay, and I say, okay, I'm gay. Hi. And I'm political. Like, I'm, I had a lot of gay friends, so um, a lot of artists and a lot of people in the movement, if you will, you know, from West Hollywood and, you know, all over. And I just, and in talking to them, I always wondered, like, when we'd have lunch or whatever, I always wondered, why are they so obsessed with politics, these guys? Oh, yeah, they were trying to recruit me when I'd have dinner with them, you know, and, and I, it, did, it didn't really happen, you know. I, but that's what they were, that's probably why I was invited. <laughs> I was a lot younger and handsome back then. But um, anyway, no, I, what I've noticed in, in hanging around, you know, and I just noticed that, that, you know, it was all about politics. That's all, I mean, we could sit at the table and, you know, basically I was writing a screenplay and these guys were writers and stuff in Hollywood. So I'd sit down at the table with these people and, um, you know, I probably the only one that, that wasn't on their side, you know, wasn't, quote, gay, unquote. And they just thought I was in the closet and they were going to help me come out or whatever. But anyway, bottom line is I've had those experiences where I was around a lot of gay people, and they only talk about one thing, politics. And it was the same thing about the evil right, and the evil Republicans are, gonna, are, are, are there, and you know they're so bad that they should all be killed. Uh, I'm seriously, this is what's being discussed at the table, is how to kill, uh, you know, the, I, I forget who was in uh, Reagan, I mean, it, was, it goes back a long, I forget who was even in office, I think Clinton was in office back then, before that was Bush. Anyway, so they would talk about the whole New World Order and the whole Nazi regime they want to bring in and the whole anti-gay thing they saw as being a political um, struggle. So they're obsessed with politics, these guys. And that doesn't mean the whole, all of West Hollywood was. It just means that, um, you know, the certain group of friends that I had were just obsessed. And, you know, and I, at that time, I was pretty... I think I was probably pretty radical myself. I was, you know, not in agreement with the views, but I was, you know, thinking about things. And I hadn't come to any conclusions. But, uh, so, but, but the, to, the way that we're talking is just like the conspiracy blogs, you know, because it, it, when you're gay and political, it all becomes a conspiracy against you. So anything that would take away your right to be gay, which also... You know, and they won't admit this, but it also means we need lots more, okay? There is that whole thing going on, and, and, and that's stupid not to admit that because it gives more strength, but what, are the, but what are their politics aligning with? This is my question. 
and they're aligning with you know um, groups out there who want to bring in um, you know a new world order, or if you like a top-down totalitarianism, sort of like the Denver Airport. But they don't; they're not thinking that way, and so they're they're not thinking that they're, they they they. They're not thinking they're going to. They're being used by sinister forces who are very elitist, and uh, would use them like using the greenies and the you know the gays and the this and that, all for political purposes. They don't think they're caught up in um, in an ideology that would service the very elite bloodline elites at the top and everyone else a slave. Like you know, they don't think they're aiding and abetting some beast or some monster. They are trying. And obsessed because um, they, it's like when you say, okay, I quit smoking. It's like, okay, now everyone needs to quit because it's a sin before God. Okay, it's, it's like, okay, so I'm gay. It's, and, and, here, and if you don't, if you're not in the spirit or with the Lord or, you know, at that, at that moment, you're going to think, well, you know, and this is what they think. And I'm summing it up and I'm kind of, you know, generalizing, but I hope you, you know, those of you who are very sensitive and you, you know, to the issue and you want to pick at straws or, you know, you want to nitpick fine. But the consensus is kind of like, well, most people are gay. They're just not admitting it. And that's really the ethos. And that, that's really it. So it's okay then to push to get people to be honest And even the whole religion centers around being gay and, and politics centers around being... Everything is... The gay thing is all-encompassing. And when you're in West Hollywood, it's, you know, it's brutal because, you know, everyone's vying to have the best body and the best this and the best that and to be in with it, you know, make money and be the coolest designer and whatever, you know. And um, there's kind of like an unspoken rule, and I've said this before, that when you get to be, let's like, say, around... And, every, and I've never had anyone disagree with this, so... You know, this is, you know, they'll say, how do you know all that? It's like, well, you know, I'm not stupid and I'm not blind. And I've been in L.A. and I've been around. So, you know, here's the bottom line. Um, you get to be of an older age. You need to be established financially or the community turns its back on you. And I mean, it's a sad thing that it's a youth oriented movement, if you will. And uh, I'm not, I can't, lead, I'm talking about mainly men at this point. I'm not talking about women because I don't know of um, the situation with uh, lesbians. I don't know what the thing is there. Transgender is kind of like the same thing, falls in the same category. Um, you know, in the end, it all comes down to money, you know. Um, people join the lifestyle because they think they're going to make money and be famous. And they, they realize that. And this is true that, you know, the, the, uh, the you know, the, um, what do they call it? The, uh, the, the gay mafia, you know, runs Hollywood. And, and I would say that that's true. In other words, what projects get green lighted? What, uh, you know, you have to be on good. No, you know, you don't think there are some doubt. No, they're very, you know, elite. And, you know, uh, this whole gay thing has been around since the beginning of time. And many, many leaders of countries and, and you know, it's, it's, it's not like it's been a, an abomination. It's almost like secret societies have all kinds of initiations or gay initiations, even if someone has a family and whatnot. It was perfectly fine in ancient Greek times, when I say ancient, around the time of, uh, the time of uh, Jesus, uh, for a householder and a very wealthy guy to have a relationship with 12-year-old boys and, and, and young men. You know, let's not, I don't want to just focus on the pedophile thing, but it was perfectly acceptable to be a house, in fact, expected that a householder, and, and the same thing in the Middle East, it's, it's perfectly acceptable, uh, and even though there's death in Islam for gays, which is weird because gays embrace people of, like, you know, of Islam a lot, of, a lot easier than they do a Christian. I think I'm digging myself into a hole here, and I'm not really making a cohesive statement. I'm just trying to say that this, this gay thing is, it runs deep and it's tied in with this antichrist situation. Now, I've known Christians that are gay in West Hollywood, no less, who are artists. And one in particular that comes to mind right now. 
And um, man, I tell you, he, he was so tortured, I think. Because for, for, you know, he was very intact and had a kind of sense of, I mean, he was, you know, a Bible believer really before I was. I mean, he was, you know, doing art of, like he did one of the Whore of Babylon, you know, flying across the sky, you know, on a dragon. And um, then I actually bought the piece and I had him suspended from my, from my ceiling. And I thought that was too tough. He had all kinds of just really tough art of biblical themes. And all he did was biblical themes. And they were the most seriously horrific things. And I was just so twisted myself, I put him in the house, you know. And eventually, um, eventually they really bothered me, you know. It's, it's like going to a movie set and taking the props from a horror film, really gory, you know, putting it as art in your house. I mean, that might be okay for a while, but after a while, you, 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 you know, it, it uh, wears off. So... You know, we had discussions about it, and I, you know, and I never really got to asking him, well, how do you grok the gay thing, you know, and you live with your partner, and you have your relationship here, and you're living in West Hollywood, and then there's this church around the corner you're going to. How is it working out with the biblical statement of that, you know, sodomy is an abomination and all that? How does that, you know, how does that work? And of course, in the Bible, it's not obsessed with that. But it's, you know, in a few places, you have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. You have the, you know, the Paul saying, you know, men with men, women with women is an abomination. You have, and it goes on. Is there a goal, for example, to not be sexually oriented in that way? And the answer was, no, it's kind of a fluid process. There was no plan on getting out. And I know they have the Exodus organization for getting gays out. In other words, if the feeling of some Christians is that they need to set up an outreach to get people out of these cults. You know, the sex cults. Um, or they're going to burn. And I'm looking at another whole other way. I'm looking at the larger picture of, say, the Antichrist system or Babylon system and how the gay thing, the PETA thing, the, the various, um, you know, the ter- change in law enforcement and, uh, you know, military and so forth, how they're trying to transform it into the angel of light deception of Lucifer and how it's being used. And I know that the, the people I knew, for example, they weren't Satanists, they weren't Luciferians, they were gay politicos who were writers and intellectuals and artists. It's hard for me to come to an actual conclusion. I'm actually grappling with it right now as we speak, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, am, um, I know what the Bible says. I also see how the gay through the color of law thing could eventually use um, people's being Christian or the Bible itself as hate behavior and speech as a legal, uh, 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 under the color of law, to be able to incarcerate individuals who will not give up the Bible or their faith in Jesus because it's anti-gay. You know, you can see how it wouldn't take much linkage legally to set up a precedent like that. And under the color of law, just like arresting the Jews, you could round up the Christians and round up the Bibles as being illegal because it's intolerant. And they're very adamant because I've known so many of them and, and basically the political thing is just really huge. Like I say, with, with a lot of these guys, it's, and especially when they get you know, going up toward 40, it's all about politics. And they're zealots. You know, and, it, 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 and if, if they're not checked, if they don't have a spiritual foundation they're not born again, I mean, if their eyes aren't open, they will do, um, they will serve the function that uh, they're serving, which is to produce laws that will make it, um, along with the, the atheist crowd, along with all these other crowds, to get the Ten Commandments off the buildings, to get any kind of biblical references where the opposite would be true, where the, 
you know, the, the Antichrist spirit would push Antichrist things on people and they would have to accept it or eventually uh, be considered a social pariah and possibly a, a uh, eventually a felon, obviously, or, or someone making an illegal thing. For example, having a Bible study would be a, a felonious uh, act at that point. And we're seeing, you know, and I, being a Christian, I have to stand up and say something. No, I don't want to fight with my gay friends. I don't want to have a fight, you know, or hatred in any way. I want to show the big picture, you know, of where this thing kind of leads, both especially where it leads for them. You know, where does it lead for um, gay people? It doesn't lead to freedom. It's just basically useful idiots helping a political um, thing happen in the world. And, 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 and the true believers, whether they're gay or not, because I hate to call people by a sex act or a sex name. I like to call people human beings, you know. And human beings are capable of having sex with anybody. And they're, you know, my friends are right about that. Yes, everyone can be gay. Anyone can be, you know, and, and anyone can do anything. A man can do anything. Sexually, and he, he's capable of any kind of sex and, and enjoying it. Or feeling guilty about it, which may heighten the enjoyment, whatever. You know how twisted it can get. So, gosh. What am I doing, Lord? I'm here opening up this discussion because I feel the church has so badly handled it. And I see where the train is headed to destruction for a lot of people and a lot of pain. And the Occupy Wall Street movement, you know, you can bring into kind of, you know, this sort of groupings of people being used and true believer communists who they don't want. Because when I say the communist globalist new world order, ultimately it's fascism, communism, but then this kind of blooms into totalitarianism, which is really the goal. Not communism, not workers' rights, not uh, environmentalism, not gay rights, not, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we get back to f focusing back in on the gay thing. So we get back into, um, I can hear the questions now. So do you think we should all repent and not be gay, Z? Well, all I can tell you is that I have to repent every day because I'm so lousy. I do things, and I'm, the only thing I'm doing is I, you know, I uh, drink too much, let's say, and then I have to repent if I do something unhealthy. I, I'm always, you know, doing something that just seems to be wrong. And sometimes I, I get really angry, you know, and then that's, I got to repent about that. And then sometimes bad thoughts come into my head and, you know, I, I'll give them an audience for a while and I got to repent about that. And just on and on and on. So I'm no angel. Not in that sense. <laughs> fallen, fallen angel. But not in that sense. So what can I tell you? Should I form an outreach to get you out of there so that you won't perish in, in your sin? I think the whole approach here is wrong. I think it's automatically setting up a war between, you know, gays and Christians. And I think this is really unfortunate. And it looks like, you know, the Chick-fil-A guy and supporting, I don't know what the groups he supports, but there's a rumor on the internet that, you know, that he was supporting a bill in Uganda that puts gays to death you know, or supporting an organization that is supporting that. And I read a little more about it, and then that was debunked. So, you know, it's just a war, okay? It's a war. It's a bloody war. It won't take much of it go to a civil war, which there will be blood. So it's like, now, now you got me here. I have to kind of prophesy about this. I have to look into it deeply. And I look into it with the idea of, well, Lord, what's the solution, Father? What is the solution to this war? between Occupy Wall Street uh, versus, uh, I don't know, the establishment, gays versus Christians, 
but okay with Islam. That puts gays to death. Uh, and on and on. How do we solve all this hypocrisy and all these double standards and all these, this, this whole collision that's coming together? And the word I get is planned. All the social planning for this civil war, this, this global civil war, has been decades in the planning. Decades and decades in the planning to get the gays to go against the Christians and this will go against that. You know, Christians off to the slaughter and, you know, to bring in this uh, Islamic caliphate and kill all the Islamics. You know, there's, there, it's all going to go in stages and it's all been planned for decades and decades. So the war between gays and Christians that seems to have flared up is not a war at all. It's a faux war. It's a false narrative because Christians don't hate gay people. They don't, you know, and many Christians have struggled with it also but they don't want to call it other than, anything other than sin. And the gay person that's really with it wants to get over their um, scars. And they think if they can get more people to be gay and it'll be okay to be gay, then there won't be those horrible stigmatic internal scars, which come from guilt, by the way. And it's, so the Bible's to blame for bringing, making it a, a, a hang-up making it a problem, and if that was gone, and if everyone had to be gay, then, then there'd be no problem anymore. I mean, and, and that's kind of like going into the id, of the, going into the childlike way of looking at it. But it's kind of like, you know, the, that's it. And we don't need Christianity to make us feel guilty about something that we're naturally, you know, born to do. I think the saddest thing is the whole focus on the flesh. To gratify and glorify the flesh and make it okay to do what you want in the flesh is ultimately Satan's goal. And that's the goal of, you know, the whole communist thing and, and the Nazis and everybody else made, you know, used all that stuff to, to produce. Um, because really the gay thing is so innocent. Where do you, you know, real depravity, real, real, real stuff is, um, you know, what the, uh, the elites do behind closed doors would, I, I mean, people wouldn't have a stomach for it, but they're addicted to it. I mean, it goes way beyond uh, whether it's perverse to be gay or not. It goes way beyond that as far as gratifying and glorifying the flesh. The Christian doesn't want to gratify the flesh and doesn't want to honor the sin, wants to call the gay thing a sin because the Bible does. And the gay person feels oppressed because he's thinking that, you know, obviously that is an affront to me. I don't need that kind of guilt. That kept me in the closet for a long time. I wasn't happy that whole time. I had to hide out like a fugitive. And it's all the fault of these a-hole Christians. And we just got to get rid of them. And let's face it, that's what's on people's minds. We got to get rid of these Christians. And more and more people are thinking that. And by the way, Jesus predicted that there would be a time in Matthew 24 when, and, and also the book of Revelation when these Christians would be rounded up for their faith and put to death as a way of making society happy. Well, that's a satanic sacrifice. You take part in that, in that kind of hatred, the Lord will, you'll burn. I'm just telling you, I'm just gonna cut to the chase in the prophetic. You will burn. if you put them to death, if you participate in that and, and, and are okay with it. But with the mean-spiritedness that I've seen, it doesn't take much, you know, it's like a lot of tinderbox. You just, one match and up it goes and oh well. And if there was a color of law, of uh, who gets to execute the Christians, who gets to pull the lever on the guillotines or the, the hangman's noose or however they're executed or the firing squad, um, you know, could it actually be a crime to be a believer in Jesus Christ? Could it actually get to that point? Well, it would take obviously many years. But yes, it could get to that point. It has before. It wouldn't, who would volunteer to be a Nazi at that day if you could round up the Christians and put them to death? I know a guy here in our neighborhood here who was a real nice guy and he, he built the roads here and, you know, he's kind of a old now, but he, you know, he had a sticker on his car that says, so many Christians, so few lions. 
And that was his bumper sticker for quite a while. I told you about that years ago. Um, he put that on there after meeting me. Because, <laughs> oh no, one of them moved into the neighborhood. I was like a blight on the neighborhood. No longer. I'm no blight on the neighborhood. I'm, I'm one of the few people improving the neighborhood. But um, that was how it was perceived. Well, one of them is moving in. Oh no. There goes the neighborhood. It was just like that. Of course, you're talking about here being a very left-wing bastion, a very liberal bastion. New Mexico around Santa Fe is, it's, you know, there it's, it's 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 pretty much a blue state, but it's a, um, you know, that's the way it is. That's that's the kind of people who are here, and they they, I'll just put it plainly, they many of them are gay. Yes, I think this guy's gay. I don't know, but I have a feeling, unmarried, you know, young guys around. I. It doesn't take a genius. But in this neighborhood, you know, there's lesbian couples, there's, you know, obviously gay guys, there's all kinds of people and artists and things that live around in here. And, um, you know, and, and that eat at the local restaurant. And they hate Christians. And they hate the Bible. With real passion enough to kill people. Uh, well, if it was left unchecked and fomented and stirred up, yeah, well, we were all capable of killing people, so absolutely. Is there any way to avert this war? No. That's the second part of my talk today. It's already prophesied, and you well know, that it goes to the point where, you know, Christians will be put to death for their testimony. Um, and they'll be put to death through legally through the color of law. And um, it will be considered very soon, especially the way the left is pushing this, and it's the left, make no question about it, that, um, you know, they keep looking like they tried to find this guy, James Holmes, the shooter in Aurora, Colorado. They, they tried to say he was part of the Tea Party right off the bat. They keep looking for a way to brand, because they know the Tea Party are filled with Christians. They want to brand them as terrorists. They want, to, they want to marginalize. They want to lock them up. They want to put them to death. They can't admit that to themselves because they're supposed to be compassionate. They love each other. They say legalize love on their posters, and then the O is an Obama symbol. <laughs> yeah, it's a left-wing, you know, the gay thing is a left-wing movement. So it's a lot bigger than just a sex act or a sexual preference or orientation, if you like. It's a much bigger, I only see the big issue. What does this mean geopolitically? It means we're going into that time of the Antichrist where people will be marked and you'll have to conform in, in order to, uh, what's conformity look like? You know, we know what it is today. I guess you could say that conformity, in a way, is a gay movement thing. You know? But the gay thing couldn't exist as a lever unless there was guilt and shame involved that would be exported from the psyche to the opposition. And so instead of within, it's without. And so the hatred that's within gets exported without and then targets people that are threats to it and then wants to kill it. People who are unchecked in their consciousness will fall into that trap and make it an us versus them thing, which is not it because we are all capable of you know, joining a, a, the gay movement, which is a political movement. Just like the PETA movement of, the, of protecting the animals isn't about that, it's a political movement just like uh, liberal politics in general, but it's, it's a political and then behind the scenes it's satanic. Just like conforming to society to be connected to the world is a satanic act, but it is also uh, you know, a political movement, if you will. Beyond that, it's really a spiritual movement. And the spiritual movement is to bring in the Antichrist to rule over the planet, which would then be a utopia for the few people remaining after the World War III and after the depopulation uh, efforts of the scientists and the social re-engineering 
that goes on because we're, we're looking forward to a new beautiful world made by man, not by God, not by the, you know, it's really, but it's really made by man who's influenced by the demonic, who is uh, in, in allegiance with demonic spirits, who is obeying, yes, sir, I'll do what you say, give me more technology, who's in this kind of allegiance like that, which leads to then ultimately the destruction of society and mass death for everyone. If, anyway, let's get back to the Chick-fil-A thing. So here we are having all these people suddenly show up, and I think it doesn't really matter in the end um, what your denomination is. I think in the end it will matter, you know, what your affiliation is. In other words, are you still part of the world? Being, are you still conformed to the world and connected to society? Or are you a Christian? That will become clear. The church is clearly conformed to society and not really Christian. See, I must make that distinction as well. The church is not really Christian, but they have Christian values. And now that they're being persecuted, they may actually become Christian, meaning um, delivered from the uh, conformity to the world system that is needed in order to buy and sell and trade and be uh, acceptable. Okay, so a true Christian is not connected in that way. Um, and that becomes the egregious thing to where they say, I'm going to bear false witness against you. Jesus said this would happen. I will bear false witness against you because I need you out of here. I don't want people like you walking around. So we'll just make something up that you did some crime and then put you away. And for many, many years, there's been persecution like that for actual true Christians not to be confused with church Christians. And, you know, there's many in the churches that don't understand what I'm talking about, and that's fine. There is no one that is conformed to the world who will go in the end with God upon death that is conformed to the world. They have to be delivered out or else they will, all their external Christian work, feeding the poor, taking care of the needy, you take your, taking care of the sick, feeding the poor, you know, doing the, the, the works of Christ will be ignored because at the end of the day, it's, it's like the, the wedding feast. When someone's not dressed properly for the wedding feast, they're cast into the outer darkness by the Lord. It has nothing to do with what they've done or haven't done for the Lord or how good a person they are. They just, you know, they don't have, you know, they're obviously, the, the moral of the story is you have to be one or you, you, it's not anything personal. God is no respecter of persons. You're thrown out. It doesn't matter what you've done. Your works will be ignored. The works are only judged if you are one, you know, and you can't be one if you conform to Babylon and with this veil and this veneer of churchianity, uh, you know, which is then kowtowing to the state, which is then with, through the 501c3 agreement, having um, infiltrators there who are spying on the, uh, the Christians. And you know, but those aren't really, the, the, the mistake they're making is that those aren't really Christians because they are, they are churchians. They're, they worship the church, they worship the pastor, they worship the, the Bible study, they worship the, 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 the coffers, they worship the, the milieu, the, the order, the, the, the society, the ethos, the, uh, they, they worship the, um, the, the kind of social order, so it becomes a mimicking of the conformed external order. And the mimicking of the order means that children have to be, through their youth groups, conformed to society to belong to church, which is an abomination unto God. Rest my case. There is no one who can argue that with me. And no one ever has, and no one has even attempted. The only thing they've done, and including a lot of people you guys listen to on the radio, no, no, not, not everybody, Let's not paint with a broad brush, but some of the guests we've had here in the past and so forth and so on um, fit in that category that I just described. And the, how do I know? I use myself as a litmus test. One guy said he had to drop me because I was too unstable. I'm like, oh, you have no idea what unstable is, uh, buddy. I know just who it was, too. You have no idea 
what awaits you a few months hence. You're going to fall apart. You're going to lose, lose your family. You're going to lose your... No one's going to care who you are, that you had a radio show or that you're on the air. You'd, no one's going to care. It, it won't be about that. You will not be a leader anymore. Because if that's what it takes to save you, then that's what's going to happen. A guy who's fallen in with the wrong crowd. Who, a crowd that deigned to take over the internet Christians with their all, and pretending to be alternative to the churches. These are nothing but churchians in disguise, still connected to the world. Still part of it and believing that anybody that has a view other than that is somehow um, a pariah or unstable, just the same opinion the world would have. That is terrible, but their day is also coming along with the church. The church in America will not be effective in staving off the, I mean, it, it's too late now to stave off the judgment of Yahweh on America. The judgment coming in the form of the legal uh, movements to outlaw Christianity as hate uh, behavior and speech is under, under, it may take a while, but that's the, that's the judgment. And then that will ultimately, you know, lead to um, a, a culling from the herd. In China, they leave external churches or state-owned churches, if you will, in place to make it look like they're tolerant, but the real church is underground in China. And I know a lot of these Chinese, bless their hearts, have been praying for our church, that is the body of true believers who are, you know, walking the walk, to be persecuted. And the only way you could be persecuted, the way they mean it, the way they're praying for us to be persecuted, is if legally it's not you know, legal to be one. And slowly you see that being put in place. Like you can't have Bible studies unless you have a, you know, the regulations. And what they really want to do is get, get all that. And they, they use the gay thing and other things that if someone is caught teaching biblical principles in, in, to, grade, to grade school, they'll be guilty of child abuse. I mean, that's the kind of persecution I'm talking about. Oh, it's already here. I'm not saying anything you guys don't know. I'm just saying that, I'm just kind of putting it into a, a verbal uh, order here so we can take a look at it and, and, uh, and understand that it, it won't be long now before that, that kind of thing is full bloom. Um, and then you'll have your children taken away from you and uh, they'll be taught uh, all the opposite values of the Bible as being good. And uh, they'll be taught how to play the game and how to, you know, ultimately the society will want to get its hands on the children. And that's what judgment looks like. And of course, the death of many um, under the color of law, like it was in Nazi Germany and all that. That's what judgment looks like for our people here. And that is a blow against the church. It is saying, God is saying to the church, you people in the denominations and the 501c3 nationwide have failed your flocks. The only way there's going to be a burgeoning church in America is if Christianity is suddenly made illegal. And then pastors are going to have, the people are going to come to the churches and say, you pastors have to speak about certain things only and you can't talk about politics or the leaders, and we're going to keep our eye on you, and we have the legal authority to be here to, because this, is an, a, this for years has been a way for, for legal spying on the uh, church congregation. They don't know they've been, they've been spied on, and dossiers are kept on every single member by the FBI and other people undercover who have been there for years since, under the color of law. It's perfectly, and it's perfectly legal for them to be there undercover. Brother Z, they, that, that's already happened. I know. I know. But Brother Z, that's already happening. I mean, they, they can't talk about politics right now or they, get the, they lose their, their charitable contribution status. I know. What I mean by that is they can't, you know, there's a, a wider variety of things they can't talk about. And 
they have to play ball with the state. Now, they can play ball with the state. There still will be a building there called church. Okay? Um, and it will be, you know, they'll ultimately be asking the pastors if they would be, it would be in agreement to help retrain their flocks vis-a-vis -vis polit political correctness to get them to be able to, you know, take part in the world and to be a part of, the, of, of history of the new world, the way things are going, because we're transforming the planet and there are new values and new mores. There's no borders. And we, we really need you to teach the children to, to kind of assimilate and be citizens so you're not outcasts. And will you play along? Uh, yes, we will, uh, you know, whoever, uh, to the global state. Absolutely. We, we're here to serve. Jesus would want us to go along. I mean, it gets down to that. That would be the judgment, full bloom against the church for what it's doing now, kind of secretly or furtively. But this would be the full bloom manifestation uh, that the churches would be full on indoctrination centers for the children. And uh, the adults would be there to reinforce that idea of whatever the state wants to do, they will go along. And, um, you know, they will also uh, report anyone to Homeland Security that uh, seems to not be getting with the program, seems to not quite be understanding that, that four fingers really means three fingers, you know, nod and wink. It's, they just are blind to all that. They're, 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 they need to learn how the, how the ropes work. They need to learn what the pecking order is. They need to learn how to behave in society. And um, you guys have to teach them or we're going to put you out of business. They can't stand out as separate doing their own thing out there for, for Jesus. We'll shut them down. We'll, we'll, make, we'll make it illegal. You're either a member of a church or you, you've, you know, and you, they try to have a Bible study or do anything like that, Any, anywhere that, a prayer circle, anything like that going on uh, will be illegal uh, quite soon. And that's what judgment looks like. And I think you will all agree with me that is a, a obvious judgment, the hand of God. It's also reaping what we've sown. We've allowed these churches to be um, friends with the world because people that go to church, let's face it, want business connections. They want successful Christians to hobnob with. And they want to improve their social status. So not only that, they want to see what the neighbor's wife looks like. You know, I mean, it's for years it's been like that. Um, the solution is repentance, obviously. And may I say this to, if there's any gays listening, um, you know, and, I, and, and uh, first of all, hello, God bless you. Check this out. You gays are going to love this. Um, <laughs> in the churches, there's more gayness going on behind the scenes than you can ever imagine in San Francisco or West Hollywood. I'll just put it that I'll just leave it at that. You'd be now I know you've suspected it, but you'd be absolutely shocked and horrified that there is a subterranean gay ethos or in the club. You're absolutely right. And it's rampant throughout. And you can say, oh, because of all that repression, people couldn't be themselves. Some people used to tell me to be myself, you know what I mean? So I just start doing all kinds of drugs. <laughs> You know, telling people to F off and just letting my hair down. And when I let my hair down, I mean, people get hurt. Really hurt. Because that's part of my thing. You know, my own depravity is I do hurt other people. I'm sorry, you know. That's why I keep my guard up. What I'm talking about is a dishonesty in the church. You know, they would never admit that they had anger toward me. I love you, brother. You know what I'm saying? I've gotten that a lot from churchians. I love you, brother. You know, that you could see the seething anger coming out. That I would deign to prophesy. I've, I've tried to prophesy to them, and they block the doors. They don't want to hear it. We already know what you're going to say. We don't want to hear it. You know, you're a sinner just like us. Z. Come on in. The water's fine. You mean as a portal to joining Babylon? It's, 
it's the conundrum of the conundrums, you know? Um, no, I, I don't mind going as a guest if I had to go as a guest at church. It's just, you know, I can't really open my mouth because they jump on you, you know? They, they want everyone conform. If you say you're a Christian, they have a certain conformity, conformity they want you to conform to. And if you don't, then they, you know, they kick your butt out. And if they kick your butt out, then they have done harm to one of God's children. His wrath is, will be upon them. And the wrath comes in the form of forcing them to be politically correct. Because let's face it, conformity today is not the same as it was even 25 years ago. Conformity today is just PC, right? Political correctness. Uh, conformity today involves a lot more than just you know, signaling, you know, that you'll take your place in the hierarchy, do what they tell you and bow down. It's a lot more involved than that nowadays. Basically, is check your old opinions in at the door and be retrained or you're out of here. Accept the new political correctness of globalism or you're out of here. You know what I mean? Accept that your rank now is not the same as your rank before with a little group of people. You have a global rank. Accept that or you're a pariah. And then there'll be more requirements for conformity and more and more and more. Conformity used to be just basically um, bowing down to man as opposed to God, but it was done in such a way through, you know, um, that it, you know, didn't interfere with the external view people would have of a person. There would still be, they wouldn't see him as a criminal. They would say, yeah, I had to do that too. You know, what are you going to do? And they would just kind of go through like that. And then that was... Uh, you know, um, life gives you a, 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 a crap sandwich and everybody has to take a bite. And then we just look at it like, like, yeah, so we had to take a bite. So, you know, what are you going to do? Resist? Be a loser? I know it's on the minds of most of the people who are listening now who, who, who they hate this discussion, but they can't quit, keep, stop listening. Let me explain something to you. You could kill everybody that didn't agree with you and you would still feel like crap. You would still wonder if you're screwed. You'll still feel horrible. And, and you anti-Christians, you could kill every Christian and you would then start in on each other because you would still, you would not have eradicated the problem. It's in you. Everyone who's conformed, it's in you because your guilty conscience wants to come clean. You don't want to keep secrets. You don't want to be blackmailed. You don't want, you know, people to be in this, this BS hierarchy thing where you got to do what you're told by absolute idiots and morons. You want to live your own, you want to be free for one thing and you feel like you've sold your soul, like you've sold your life down the river. You want to get rid of anyone who, who would remind you of that so you could be happy for a day. It doesn't work. Out, out, damn spot. Yes, Lady Macbeth, you killed your husband. And, you know, it's not better, is it? And nothing you can do can get the guilt off your conscience. You're, you're obsessed with it now and it will ruin your life. Killing the Christians is not going to help the gay problem or the whatever, the PETA, whoever else is against Christian right now. It's not going to solve anything, okay, for, for the gays. You can make every single person gay and anything goes, uh, clothing, this and that. Everyone can become fairy dust people, whatever. Worldwide. And there would still be war, poverty, famine, all the things but you don't believe that, I know. You believe it would be a better world. It wouldn't be. A secular world um, would not be. I've seen the brutality in the gay community. I see what you guys do to each other. Give me a break. There'd be no change. The world would be just the same. So you underestimate how many people are in the gay thing hidden. And you're just figuring, well, if they all came out, they'd all be happy. Um, no. No, see, it's not about that. Get your head out of your uh, groin. It's not about that. It's none of this is about what it is, says it's about. It's about the spiritual realm. 
and existence upon earth, what we are, who we are, why we are, what we are, where we are going, what this is all about, existence. What for? To sit here and hate everybody in the name of love? I mean, gays will now hate wearing love t-shirts, but the O is an Obama election O. And what's that? This guy's one of the most hateful people on the planet, Obama. But then again, he's joined by everybody else who's also hateful that has power. It doesn't take me, it doesn't take a genius, it, it doesn't take me long to see Obama as Stalin, you know, if he got the chance, or someone like him, you know, coming after him. Doesn't take, it doesn't take much to see another Hitler, another Pol Pot, another Mao. Doesn't take much at all for me to see the West falling to that kind of thing. And that's a spiritual judgment against the people who gave up God because they were told it wasn't cool or who faked it. Worse are the ones who fake it in the churches. They're going to get the judgment first. So if that's true, what I just said, prophetically speaking and biblically speaking, they would be the first to be put to death for, for no crimes they didn't commit. The only crime the church has done is that they join the world system. That, that's a crime not to humanity, that's a crime to God. That's what they're being judged for. That's why they're in trouble with God. That's why they're not effective at creating social change because they believe you can be a friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. James 4.4 calls that adultery. It's just no way. The, the Christians of the early church were chased around, persecuted, thrown in the lions, uh, everything else. Burn it. The, the real Christians of the day were brought in by the Inquisition, who were, were corrupt, and put to death as witches when, in fact, they were just Christians, but they wouldn't conform to the churchianity going on or bow down to the Catholic Church at the time. Uh, that, too, just like that. Martyrs are very common in Christianity around the world. That's the form of person. It's the worst is saved and reserved for the churches because they know God's word and somehow they got soft, they abrogated it, they wanted to compromise, they wanted to not be picked on, they wanted to have a big church like Rick Warren or somebody like that, you know, lots of people, lots of money and lots of success. So they, you know, And that's why you church people are not taken seriously and why your numbers are dwindling every day because people know it is not the real thing. It's a form. What, what is that scripture? You guys out there, you know, I'm, I, I need to really have a form of godliness but to deny the spirit thereof. Trish, can you look up that scripture? Have a form of godliness, but deny the spirit thereof. Look, there's nothing new here. The, the, the synagogues of the past, okay, before Jesus, um, put the prophets to death and then put statues of them on the wall to worship. I kid you not. I mean, that is exactly what they did. And they put Jesus to death. It was the religious establishment. It would be the same as if you know, Billy Graham uh, crucified Jesus. You know, um, or the Pope, or whatever. It's um, it just shows the desperate straits we're in, folks. It shows, and we're all in this boat. You know, back to the gays. Do you really want to kill people? Do you really think that killing people? You know, I'm talking to the more militant, you know, I know you're all saying, oh, I'd never do that. That's the, those right-wing hate groups, that they're the ones who want to kill people. They want to kill all gays. Well, that's an extreme thing. I wouldn't call it right-wing. I, I, let's get rid of right-wing, left-wing. Let's just talk about it in the, in the way of, do, do, would a Christian, uh, an upright Christian, want to kill anyone? The answer is no. Hate anyone? No. 
would they um, agree to, to to become gay to be compassionate? No, they wouldn't do that. Would they would they um, uh, would they love a gay person but not would, would call you know a homosexual activity gay uh, gay activity um, a sin? Yes, they would, and and that's where the that's so it's so the conflict is spiritual. It's Second Timothy three five. Is that what it is? Yeah. 2 Timothy 3 5. Yeah, uh, I had I actually had that scripture out earlier. And yeah. the form of God will deny his power, have nothing to do with him. You know, yeah, well, the, we have had nothing to do with him, haven't we? We have followed that. 2 Timothy 2 3 5. Five. 3 5? Okay. Okay, I love it. Okay, here's some hard medicine, folks. I've, I've, I've been very compassionate today and very loving, more so than I would like to be, probably. I probably feel like I need to do something hateful now because I've been loving. Seeing us all in the same boat, all as one. Well, I do. Well, you know, it gets into the, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. And isn't that what it really is, ultimately? We love ourselves, we want to gratify. It's not really about your partner. You want to get off. You want to gratify yourself in every which way possible. You know, money, clothing, sex, whatever it is. It's about you. Covetousness, boasted, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady or heady, high-minded lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Hey, if the shoe fits America, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such, turn away. Turn away. So, for the hedonists out there, which we've all been, one on the path of God would turn away from you. Uh, and that would mean that, that would mean that they would not be part, in other words, turn away, let me interpret this, put it in context, so that you won't be partakers and so that you can remain uh, on the holy walk as best as possible. You can't do that if they're throwing temptations at you right and left, which is what people that are into hedonism which, by the way, um, uh, knows no bounds sexually. Men, women, you name it. You know, there is no, like, slot to put someone in. You know, uh, transgender, cross flamers, this and that. You name it. Anything goes. Uh, when it comes to gratifying the self. Well, if I'm around a person like that, and I'm kind of on the straight and narrow, which I am on, uh, it's a hard path, too. But when I was younger, I didn't want to hear anything about it. I just want to do what I want to do when I want to do it, period. Anyway, when I'm around someone like that now, there's a tension, there's a, there's a natural antipathy. And that antipathy is because, you know, I won't jump in the sin and I'll call it that. And the person involved in the hedonism doesn't want it called sin and wants to keep on gratifying themselves and they want everyone to jump in there with them. And it comes down to that. You know, it's like the guy that gets off alcohol. He says, now all of you guys have to quit drinking or you're going to hell. You know, it's the same thing. On the, on the hedonistic side, you justify us. So anyone who doesn't join me in these pleasures is anathema. And I will turn away from you. And you're done. Who do you think you are, hypocrite? And then it, the shoe's on the other foot. And then, you know, it's hate, hate fest to all. All, all will kill all. In the end, all swords come out in Hamlet and everyone gets killed. Okay? That's a, a, a microcosm of humanity. It will lead to a bloodbath if the forces that are being put in place by our political leaders through their great compassion, and by the way, they know their social planners know it will come to a bloodbath. That's why they're outfitting Homeland Security who also take part in the bloodbath as well. The bloodbath will be a civil war in, because the money's all dried up and they're going to foment a civil war, you know, gay on Christian, this on that, this on that, this on rich and poor, 
Occupy versus Tea Party, you know, all these dichotomies they've set up to throw a match in and flame it up to get themselves off the hook. Would Obama spend blood like that to get himself off the hook and maximize his power while everyone suffers? If he had to make everyone suffer for his own pleasure, would he do it? I will let you answer that. If the answer is yes, he should not be president. He would be no different from any other despot dictator. But then again, I'm talking about Harry Reid. I'm talking about the Congress. I'm talking about the whole thing. The path we're on now is it goes something like this. Well, the money's gone, so we need to whip them up into a civil war. Heck, that'll depopulate it all anyway. And after that's over, we can have our new uh, world order. We'll create a civil war globally, just complete mayhem and everyone killing everybody while we sit here and lavish ourselves with caviar, champagne, and lots of sex and power and, and boast of how powerful we're going to be when we emerge with the new world order all on the Denver airport. Okay, great. The Lord wants me to tell you that in the end, the Lord wants me to tell you that in the end, there won't be any divisions like um, 501c3 and, and, and Christian and you know the one, the one that's outside, the, prof, the wandering prophets outside who won't be heard by the church inside. It's just going to come down to the believers versus the non-believers, period. And many in these churches will be waking up now to understand. And they understand full well that I have not, I have loved them enough to take their crap without retaliation. And I still speak the same word that you can't be playing footsie with the devil and be a friend of God at the same time. You can't get your provision from the world and turn around and say it's coming from God. There's a two lines. You're either going to serve the Lord or serve the devil, but you can't serve both. Now, that's been the heart of my message. And the reason I was brought to speak was to tell the churches that very thing, which to wit and to date, they have not heeded because they know already... You know, I put it in different words. I've explained it differently. I've gone to great elaborate lengths, even written a couple of books to try to one, satirize the issue and then, you know, and make it into a, a dramatic, a dramatized issue so you can see how it clashes. I just think people in the churches don't believe in God. That's, that's the problem. I don't love God. And I do believe that they're, they, they're charitable, that they have good moments, you know, just like we all do, and they can be charitable, and they can be hateful, and they can be lots of things. But I just don't believe they love God, because if you really love God, you'd just, you'd be betrothed to him, like, you know, wedded to him. And you wouldn't be an adulterer and go shopping around for another deal. You know, it'd be for better, for, for, for worse, for richer or for poorer. Lord makes many people fabulously wealthy, and others he... You know, serving the Lord doesn't mean you're going to church anyway. It just means, you know, you're, you're, you, you, you believe in him, in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You believe in him as God, as Yahweh, creator, and um, lead your life accordingly. You know, if, if it leads you to a fellowship or not a fellowship, it doesn't matter. You could be, um, you know, a CEO of a corporation, be sold out to Jesus. You could be begging bread on the street and sold out to the devil. The, most people would say, well, the one on the street seems more godly than the one wearing this three-piece suit in a corporate office. Well, I've seen it. I've seen that very dichotomy. I've seen where, where stereotypes be damned. But one thing is for sure. If you're surrounded by these ungodly people, 
and, and, and you know, the peer pressure will be such that they will get you to sin. What they want you to do is renounce your faith and join them in worshiping the flesh. Now, for an older person, that's a lot harder because the flesh is wearing out, and so it's like, ah, sheep, that's no fair. The desire for flesh um, worship is gone. Many older people then start worshiping youth as kind of like a way to get at it, you know, but it's like, ah, the, the, the thrill is gone, you know, the desire is gone. Which is a gift, actually, but pe most people in this country, uh, they're, they're trying to take testosterone and all these other supplements and hormones and this and that to, 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 to stay youthful. It's like, what are you talking about? You, you want to have, uh, you know, gin up the desire in you to lust and then fight it back? No, I want to gin up the, the, the flame of lust and go with it and prove that in, in your 60s you can still... Have, go, go at it like you, you did when you were 20. Oh boy, can't wait for that. Boy, that sounds like fun. And all those conflicts and relationships and bits and pieces of your soul flying off as you're having your dalliances and then you don't know who you, here you are. You're just, all you, your, your name should be F you, you know what? Because that's, that's your God. Not funny. We worship our flesh. When we're young, we, we want sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and as much of all, all three as possible. So Satan is the friend of the youth, and he defines what's cool and what's not. It would be very uncool to be a Bible-believing Christian in high school, for example. You would be called hateful by the current culture today. And they would throw rocks at you. Or they might spill pig's blood on you like they did with Carrie. You don't have supernatural powers of vengeance, so you just have to eat it and be traumatized. That's what we're teaching our children to become today. There will be hell to pay. I'm sorry, folks. People are already in hell here. Let me further explain this. This world is quickly becoming hell on earth where the maximum amount of suffering is going on when people are given enough subsistence to continue on. When you kill them, that they, 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 it's over, the suffering's over. No, we need to make them suffer on the way down and suffer a long time and then we'll take them out. That would be, you know, then we'll have our sacrifice for our Lord and then we'll have all the power the dark side. I don't believe the dark will, will, will out of the light. I believe there's a flip coming and this thing will be flipped very soon and already is kind of on the way. Back to, you mean, Brother Z, you don't want gay people to repent? I'm saying, well, I want us all to repent all the time for all kinds of things. But no, I don't, want to focus on, you mean like a sex act being gay? I don't want to focus on that because I guess it's because I've done so many bad things in my life, including all, every kind of sexual experimentation and all kinds of stuff. And if I, we want to talk about sex, we can talk about bits and pieces of the soul flying out with every partner you have. But um, I don't think any of us can really, you know, I just think if I can turn people to the Lord, including, um, you know, to seek him, and then I'm satisfied to know that he is the answer to all these questions. And kind of, I can't solve the, the gay versus Chick-fil-A thing. I can't solve it. Or the gay versus Christian thing that's being, that's being fomented by outside forces. And I, there's nothing I can do about it. That's what the Lord has told me. There is nothing I can do about it at all except mention it's going on, it's going to get a lot worse. The sad thing is we're all humans caught up in this drama and we just took our masks off for two seconds and sat in a room together. We would find ways to love each other. You know, maybe we wouldn't, but probably we would see that we're all just human beings and we all, if we could all just understand that we are all flawed, 
and that we will hurt one another even though we don't mean to. That we need to forgive each other or we're going to kill each other. You know, we have to love each other or we're going to hate each other. But so many people are saying love and yet they're hating. And they're, they're I love you, brother. I love everyone except Christian. You know, there's, there's that kind of thing going on, which is total hypocrisy. And that will lead to nothing but disaster and violence. And, um, you know, I make no bones about being conservative politically. And, uh, you know, I am fully aware of the warmongers on the right who want to foment war for profit. I'm all aware of the big oil companies and all that that get, get usually put on the right. Did you know that most of the top corporate execs uh, voted for Obama the last time around? <laughs> Never mind. Who's at war with the oil? Like oil company execs were voting for Obama, even though he publicly states he's at war with them. Privately, there's something else going on. Did you know there's a real cynical political game going on? Most of the really big time CEOs and the wealthy Wall Street uh, people all backed Obama, despite his talking about big oil. Is yeah. Yeah, the oil company's backing him too. I mean, that may not be down today. But um, during Obama's reign, Exxon, and Exxon uh, has had the biggest profits in the entire history of their company over the last three or four years. Crediting all that to Obama. Well, yeah, yeah, so we need green energy. Well, we're not ready, Mr. President, for green energy. I like green energy too, but you know, you can put a couple panels in, and put some geothermal in, you know, I'd love to retrofit my house with that. It'd be, you know, if I could make it work out economically, I'd jump on the board, but don't give me a Chevy Volt, please, not interested. We gotta make stations around the world, we gotta force this thing, you know, I'll give money to Solyndra, and every other company, one of them's got a hit, and none of them did hit, and all your money went down the toilet. But is he held accountable? No, his fans love him. He actually has fans, like a rock star. So did Stalin, by the way. So did Hitler, Hitler too. I'm not here trying to solve it. What I'm here trying to do is prophesy unto the people that there's nothing we can do about the troubles to come, period. That those who are of the Lord will be protected, guided through this period, period. But to do that, you must have an obedient one-to-one -one relationship with the Lord, meaning you and him, not the guy at the church or your pastor or whatever, it's you and him. And to the extent that, that, that uh, you have a relationship with him, the devil will come in and try to foul up the conf you know, thinking and, and great confusion so you don't have a clear guidance in order to take you as a lamb to the slaughter, which is really taking all of humanity toward. The goal of the enemy, the devil, is uh, the game the devil plays is to pit everyone against everyone and take down the whole thing. He doesn't care about Christians, Jews, this or that. He just wants groups to attack each other and uh, division to, to reign. And it's all to hate ourselves and then project it out on one another. All our weaknesses and all our shortcomings, we are to, uh, you know, ignore those, and ignore repenting about trying to improve ourselves and to put all that angst and anger onto everyone else as the cause of our suffering. If we just get rid of them, everything would be okay, and that's how wars start. If we just get rid of Christians, the gays will be happy. No, they won't. It'll be something else. Always something else. You mean you're not telling people, come, I'm, I'm not going to focus on I don't want to get into the language of gay meaning, you know, a human being. There are human beings involved in sin of which, well, what do you think of marriage? I think you're married if you have any kind of, if, if you have relations with someone, if you have sexual relations with a person, I guess you're married to them. But I don't really believe in the state having authority over marriage. I don't think that, I, in my opinion, 
the state should just leave it to the individuals and that's the end of it and get rid of all the benefits for everybody. Have no benefits for marriage versus non-marriage. We just marry if you want, if you don't, get the state out of it. That's my view because I'm a libertarian, you know, conservative libertarian. And uh, drugs, I think they should just legalize drugs and get the war on drugs over with. Uh, military, uh, bring them all home and protect the borders, you know. You know, if there's a legitimate fight somewhere, um, someone needs assistance, uh, choosing sides and choosing winners and losers in the Middle East. Uh, this administration has chosen the Muslim Brotherhood as the winner, and, any, and he basically takes his orders from them because he is a Muslim, so he'll do whatever he has to do, you know. He won the kingdom by flatteries. This is the same man, I think, as it, if, if he is, we're, we're at the Book of Revelation right now who wins the kingdom by flatteries. That's what Daniel 11 says. Wins the kingdom by flatteries. And, and it, it's so similar to, to Obama in a way. And if, if that's true, he, he gets us into World War III. He gets us into all kinds of wars all over the place. He conquers Libya and this and that and, you know, um, it also says Ethiopia, so I don't really know what that means because Ethiopia is not really a big player in this whole thing. So, you know, there's areas in the scripture where it doesn't line up perfectly, and that's why I, I am reluctant to say it's... A, I'm just saying, all I'm saying is it's an uncanny resemblance to the scripture in Daniel 11, the personality traits of this winning the kingdom, this, this flattery monger, which is Obama, how he wins the kingdom by flatteries. If he wins re-election, it wouldn't be on his record. It would be on flatteries, on his personality. It would, he would then be, because the economy would then go into the full-on depression, which is what they want to trigger globally and say, it's not my fault. I tried to help, but the Republicans wouldn't vote my changes into uh, effect now by executive order, by the fact we're in martial law. I will do them anyway and set up, we need to make roads and bridges and we need to confiscate all bank accounts from anyone who's rich because... We all need to band together and abolish private property, whatever else the commies want to do, and put to death anyone who doesn't see it our way. Uh, yeah, the brutalness of that is insane. And people here haven't seen that kind of brutality. I've been trying to stop communism so that they wouldn't have to suffer here under that yoke of that kind of cruelty, because it's very cruel. But the people won't listen, Lord. I'm here as a witness to say, and I want to say a true statement to everyone right now. The people here in America won't listen, Lord. They won't listen. And I'm sorry. I've told them what's going on. You use my uh, capabilities at reasoning to put forth a case that is ironclad. I've exposed the truth on the churches and everything else. We've looked a little bit into the conspiracy side of, uh, you know, program multiples, and super soldiers and all of that. But it's just, that's a distraction. You know, that's always been going on. That just, all those topics are there to sell books, to create good radio so that they can discuss it on godlike productions and feel like they're godlike. It's, it's pathetic, actually completely pathetic. And these people are pathetic. And, and, you know, I found that a lot of the conspiracy bloggers are actually left wing. You know, I ran into one guy who was just going on and on about how stupid Christians were. I think it was called the Church of Mabus or something like that. Um, which automatically gets me thinking, you know, um, the, the, the guy's just mocking the, you know, mocking uh, prophecy or mocking Christians. But no, he's openly hostile toward Christians. And then I ran into a lot of people in the 9-11 truth movement who are, again, who are conspiracy freaks and they're openly hostile. And then you find out that they really like, you know, uh, what's the name, Kucinich and people like that who are ultra left. It's like, ah, so you guys are really left-wing conspiracy theorists and where we agree is on this kind of new world order, but you don't agree that it would be a, a socialist, that you like socialism. You like, you know, if there could be an orderly communism. You like Occupy Wall Street. A lot of them have that, well, the, the, 
Um, God, I even forget the novel now. I, I actually read the novel and I forgot it. Um, uh, anyway, they have that as their, their, their mascot, is, is that mask, is their symbol. And I found that those guys are like left wing. I had one friend that, you know, said he was a targeted individual. He said that uh, Obama's a great man and that um, socialists outnumber UZ and they're going to take over. He said that, that would be just, he said that's the fulfillment of the gospel promise of Jesus. I'm like, what? What planet are you, what kind of a, what are you? And the answer is the guy was a shill. You know, he's a, yeah, a paid shill, you know, and, or spy or something like that. Um, then there's the conspiratorial people who are uh, conservative who fall into the category of uh, talking about biblical end times and they, you know, watch out when they become too obsessed and writing all kinds of books about language and the ancients and this and that and then they get into uh, the whole thing of Planet X from a biblical perspective and they, you know, they gin all this stuff up from a biblical side and they get to get on the radio like Coast to Coast that it's Antichrist actually, but they get on there approved because they're going to talk about these real scary topics of what God's going to do. And about aliens and, you know, the, they have a whole theory about it all. And the Nephilim, they write books on the Nephilim and, you know, they, they write books on transgenics and, you know, they get into all these topics. Um, they're kind of like the ones on the left in the same sense that what they're trying to do is um, they believe they're doing it for Jesus and somehow focusing on all these scary conspiracies, which do scare people, and bring in a spirit of fear. And then they warn about, you know, the end of the world and they sell preparedness things on their websites. Um, pathetic. Absolutely unbelievable. Absolutely so far gone from Jesus that it's, 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 it's sad. They have their conferences and you can go, they'll do deliverance on you there. I mean, you know, they have, they do all the forms, you know, and no one would be the wiser to think that they weren't for real. No one would believe that. I've had to stay away because, you know, from each group, both of those groups, they talk about similar conspiracies like aliens, but there's the New Age alien thing with Dulce and Sandia Labs, and they talk about all that stuff here, here in New Mexico. Uh, and then they have these New Age ideas, sort of Luciferian ideas that they think are, are theirs alone, and they, they came up with them. And then you have, I don't know what's worse, that group, I kind of like that group. We used to go to lots of MUFON meetings, and at MUFON meetings you had lots of New Agers. I sort of like them. I mean, they're easy, but then you have the Christian people and their whole thing with, they have meetings at Roswell, they try to do this Christian thing with the UFOs, and you know who those people are. And uh, most of that was to create an attraction to bring people in, and they justified it by saying, I'm really bringing them in for Jesus. And those, quote, ministries, end quote, I believe are fading out. And they will be gone pretty soon. You see, the Christian world is being transformed by Christ. And it's being turned into a church. And the mysteries going on in the church are new. And they have nothing to do with conspiracy theories about aliens or the biblical view of this or that or the other thing. You've got to come to me. Come to my website. And I'll explain it to you going through the ancient manuscripts. Nobody cares anymore about that. That's all been a ruse. That's all been a false path. But something new is coming in that's way more exciting. See, it's not like conspiracy theory ends and so we have nothing and no entertainment. I love the Lord and I need my Christian entertainment and I need to hear about... I need to hear about these guys are going to... They're going to... They're going to go down to the Mayan area if you give them money and you can donate on their page and they'll go down to uh, the, 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 the uh, you know, south, southern Mexico to Chichen Itza or somewhere and they're going to they're gonna be there to really combat the demonic forces 
And if you're a real Christian, you get behind him and send him down there for the Lord. A 1,000% ruse, false, complete deception. Total abomination. Absolutely not the Lord's calling. Not a dime from me. 100% off the path. How did these guys get so far off the path? Because they never were on it. So what was all this Christian entertainment all about online? You know, conspiracy theories and newsletters. And they have people hanging out. Praise Jesus, praise, what's the latest conspiracy? Oh, who's talking about Steve Quayle? What's he got on it? Who's got on it? How about Alex Jones? Yeah, hear what Alex said? It's all been fantasy. It's all been entertainment. We're on the cutting edge of the news, says Alex. We're tuned in here to find out what's going to happen to you next. Doesn't take a genius to see what's going to happen next. I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, I don't need you to tell me what's going to happen next. I already see the whole picture. And I could have told you this back in the, in the 60s. What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next is there's going to be more pain and suffering than there was the day before. And then after that, there'll be more. And it's really, really sad and really hard. And that's why I say, come to the Lord. Inquire of him. Open up a Bible if that helps. Go in the woods if that helps. Sit by a stream if that helps. I know one guy that he would hike up to a, a stream where there was a little flame. And uh, it was a natural flame that would never go out, like an eternal flame. And it was really cool. He sent me a video on it. And um, I really enjoyed that. Uh, you know, the piece was very comforting. And, you know, just it, it almost reminded me of uh, that the Lord is our eternal flame, you know. And it just, and it was burning on top of water because it's a weird thing with the water there was like a methane thing under the water and it was just the thing was lit and it was like a flame dancing on the water it just it goes eternally he called it the eternal flame I think but anyway he reminded me I said if I ever start uh, start repeating myself then I should stop and I did start repeating myself but now I'm no longer repeating myself I've said things today I have not said. And so, because there are new things coming. I was started going in a circle and I did back off then because it seemed that, let's put it this way, there's certain things that have to be repeated daily like the Bible and different concepts. But I think I might have overcomplicated the whole thing about um, connection to the world versus connection to God and the two paths when it's really quite simple. The, the Bible makes it very simple. If you try to do both, you're an adulterer, period. You know, we all know that there is the world and its demands, and we all know there's Jesus and his demands, and the two are incompatible. So if the church has joined the, um, you know, because the way God sees it is, uh, if you try to do both, you're with the world. In other words, he doesn't count you as with him. He won't share. You're with the world then. So, given that, then we can see the failure of the churches. And given that, we can see why they would want to keep the prophets out. Because the prophets would come in and prophesy and tell them the very same thing. And say, unless you repent and get on the path of righteousness in Christ, uh, you're damned. You're no different than the people, you, you say gay people are going to hell, are you kidding me? You're going there faster. If they're going to hell. What if a gay person believes in Jesus Christ and, and trusts him as the Lord and Savior and believes he will return? And then so it says, well, it would depend if they call sin not sin. 
And I'd say, um, well, the Bible says belief in Jesus is uh, you'll be saved. So I'll take that as the definition. In other words, did Jesus focus on that issue? No, I'm not going to either. Other than to say I've sort of, you know, know quite a lot about the struggle they're in. And, you know, you have to understand that uh, one of the, the weirdest dichotomies of all is how people feel stigmatized and, and they've been cast out and been mistreated for being gay. And I'm like, yeah, but the whole way into Hollywood is, is the gay path. I mean, so you're saying that's like a spiritual path. Say that's where it all gets c completely confused to me. You know, it all be, the issue all gets muddled and confused. Because you're really talking about a human being and human proclivities toward sin and sex and gratification and self-love, um, self-adornment, -ador self-worship, narcissism, um, you know, uh, towards sadism, masochism, ritual abuse, abuse, verbal abuse, hatred, hatred of self or hatred of others. Um, all these things are, are, are a problem collectively, you know, or as one, uh, a human being has all these, each one. So who can say I'm, you know, I'm the way, no one. Well, if that's true, Z, then you can't criticize the churches because they're just, you're just the same human being as they are. I'm not criticizing the churches. I'm criticizing joining the world to not be harassed, to be allowed to be a church, which cancels out the whole purpose in the first place. I rest my case. You can't break that argument. You cannot argue with me. It's a legal issue, period. God has no respect for a person. You know what? You deal. It's not my problem. It's your problem. You deal with it. Clean it up. Yeah, but then we'll be shut down. Oh, well, you'll have Christ, finally, for once in your life. Wouldn't you like to know what that's like? You've been pretending all this time? You've been doing a form and likeness of religion, but denying the spirit, denying the truth, the truth will set you free, my friend. You know, push into the Lord, period. And stop trying to say connection to the world and Christ is no problem. Thus, you're going to sound like Bill Clinton. He had to join the Ku Klux Klan. He needed to get elected. Yes, but did he have to become a grand wizard? <laughs> I was talking about Senator Byrd. Did he have to become, you know what I mean? It's like, well, he had to do that. Yeah, yeah, Bill. That's what we love about Clinton, don't we? He's just so, it's just right there. Why? I had to snort cocaine. I wouldn't get into the fraternity. I had to, you know, worship Satan or I couldn't have gotten into the skull and bones or whatever it is or, you know, whatever kind of cockamamie thing. Um... You know, I couldn't be present unless I was a Satanist. <laughs> so I, you know, naturally went in Rome. I think we're better than that, Bill. I think we could be. But there's a guy to me that was kind of like a hedonist that sort of embraced, you know, the way of the world. You know, made no, what I love about him is he made no bones about it. He's, he kind of cracks me up because he just... Uh, I think he's he's lovable in that way, you know, in his in his it is just unabashed, just automatic, you know, honesty that he has in that regard. And I, you know, I have to say, uh, of all the characters who've come down the pike, I found him the most entertaining of all. And yeah, looking back on it now, sure, I wish he was in office. I mean, yeah, a guy like that, um, you know, knew which way the waves. Consummate politician. 
And sure, you know, maybe all we can do is get liars and Satanists and, you know, secret society members and Ku Klux Klan. Maybe that's all we can do. You know, collect groups of collectives that boost their guy into the office. Maybe that's, maybe that's what we're stuck with. Maybe that's the real truth of it. So we never can have a real United States of America that's based on liberty and equality and the American dream and all that stuff because it's this situation of corruption that has wrecked it. That has put the, you know, the gargoyles and the and the phallus obelisk and the, uh, you know, and the and the and the vaginas and the this and that and the worship of sex and spirits and spiritualism into the architecture of Washington D.C. as if to put it, for me, the Washington Monument is just simply a middle finger up God's face. You know, we are a, a, a we 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 are a queen, and we are no widow, and we shall see no sorrow. It's almost that kind of attitude. Uh, toward God, and, you know, so I mean, why am I surprised that there's all these conflicts? Lord told me you can't solve them. I can reason with them, I can show you the legal issues, and I can show you that God is no respecter of persons, but, you know, a, another guy in a church who's going to defend the, his 501c3 corporation and all that is going to come to me and say, how dare you condemn sin, the sin that you know, we're not consciously, we're sinners. We're not joining the world. If that sin makes us more acceptable to the world, it's only because we're sinners, which is forgiven by Jesus, not that we're worshiping the world. So you're making a mistake there. So they'll make that legal distinction. And I will say to them back, God has no respect to a person. It's a legal issue. You're not dressed for the wedding feast. And so go back to that story because that's, it's, it's, it's got nothing to do really even with your character or with the things you've done that are good and noble and, and, and wonderful, it has to do with a legal issue that there's nothing I can do about it. You know, there's nothing I can do about that issue. I had people on my show who I thought, because I'm pretty naive, you know, I mean, I didn't, I, my, my goal is not to, you know, sometimes I have a goal of just repulsing people, you know, I, you know, if, uh, <laughs> Uh, so why I don't know you know I, I get some kind of pleasure out of it uh, the legal issue to me the first mistake is to become a 501c3 corporation because that then limits the free speech of the pastor, which then means the pastor's beholden to the state and not to God. That's the first mistake. And that right there creates a block, uh, you know, of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, you know, the second thing is, would be, um, you know, teaching the children to assimilate into the, you know, into the world so they can be successful. Um, calling it Christ, but really it's something else. He had to do that. He could get elected. He had to do that or he wouldn't get a job. You know, that, that kind of mentality, you know, that kind of attitude. Um, and I fully understand, you know, do you think I like to sit here and, and mention something about God's legal system to you that would show how you're, you know, I, I take no pleasure in that. If it were up to me, everyone would go free. I mean, you know, it's not, though. Well, if it were up to me, I would change everyone to be, including myself, with a push of a button to be loving, beautiful, awesome, angelic beings that God loves and they love God and, and everything is everything and everything is okay and everything is beautiful and have everyone just ascend. I, I would do that. Folks, if I could do that, push that button and you all could go free and go free of your flesh as well and be able to be those loving beings and in love and in love and euphoric and in God's concert will, concert, you know, in the will of God and to be just, um, you know, glorified in, in, and glorifying him and all in this sort of love embrace with the truth and that uh, blissed out, euphoric and excited and wonderful and happy I would push that button yesterday to make you into those beings that they're trying to get through 
transgenic science any way they can to break the out of the, the matrix of this thing. Um, out of their own suffering. And who can blame them? I don't blame them. Who can blame the churches for wanting to be successful? To have standing in the world, to be able to, uh, you know, uh, worship without harassment. You know, if you tried to set up a non-501c3 church today, you'd be shut down in about two seconds flat. It would be, actually, it, it is illegal. You'd have to get a business license and, and it still wouldn't be okay. I saw a church go in up, um, a strip mall church. And I asked them if they were 501c3. Yep, in a strip mall. You can't just even go into a storefront and open up a, a Bible fellowship where you just study the Bible as lay people. You can't do that commercially. Um, you'd have to have a permit and they would deny you the permit and then it would be illegal. And if you did it anyway, you'd go to jail, period. Um, that's pretty hard. That's like one step away from, you know, being rounded up right there. Being found with a Bible in your home. I mean, I know that sounds fantastic, but it's the kind of thing that can happen over time with the changing of laws. So it would be completely legal. It would not be a heinous act. Um, the truth of the matter is, you're right, churchians. You can't. You cannot. Uh, be a non 501c3 participant. You you cannot go to a church that is non 501c3. Um, now I ask you just because of it, and I know a lot of you like to worship, you like to sing the songs, and you like to participate, like to feel like you're making a difference. You like to you have the charity food drive, and, and all those things are good. I'm the the legal issue is still there. I I don't know what to do about it. You know I know this. That if, um, if it goes unchecked, then Jezebel runs the church, uh, i.e. the pastor's wife is Jezebel. She ends up running the church and having all the power, along with the other women of the worship leader and the, uh, you know, if, unless she's a woman, then, then, then she's, you know, it kind of goes that way to the Jezebel queens. They run things. It becomes like, you know, a gossipy beehive and uh, everyone serves the queen or they're put out. Period. Do you think God likes that? Because um, I've never seen any other I've never seen any other structure but the one I just described, and I've never had anyone tell me that their situation's different. I mean, they've tried to, but then upon further examination, we found the exact same uh, problem: that the five hundred one c three church is not honored by God. Even though the people there, I know there's people that love God and they want to sing, they want to do stuff. And uh, maybe it won't rub off on you. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. But if you, yourself, are a grand wizard, I mean connected to the world, I, I, I mean a grand wizard, I mean I had to do that or I couldn't get elected. If that's you, um, then you shouldn't be surprised at what awaits you down the road, right? Can one participate? Okay, I put gas in my car. I own things, businesses, things, you know, it's, it, you, with other people and whatnot. Um, Does that mean that I, I follow the laws and I conform to the laws of you know society and and uh, paying taxes and I and I agree with paying taxes and I, um, you know, agree with capitalism and taking a risk and I, I've taken a couple of risks last over the last year and you know I could get screwed or I could do okay I don't know I but I put my money where my mouth is is what I'm trying to say. You know, I have not just advocated taking a risk. I've taken one myself, or a few. And the reason is, is because I believe no risk, no reward, and that, you know, I pray to the Lord, and I, I, I do the best I can. But I believe that we can't create wealth 
or jobs for other people so they can feed their families unless we take risks. So I have put my money where my, I'm not just talking theoretically here, I put my money where my mouth is on this. Still believe it's the greatest system and not every one of your ventures is gonna win. Some are gonna lose, and some may win. Well, you hope the ones that win, win big enough that, that you know, it, uh, that, that you expand and that the people involved also benefit and, and greatly. And, and, and uh, this is a very tough environment for um, entrepreneurs and investors and people that would uh, spur along the economy, which should have been by now. For them to invest, it's very scary. Don't you understand that? So you got billions of dollars on the sidelines because people are afraid to invest because of this president. And, you know, as that starvation keeps occurring, we're looking at a meltdown and implosion of the federal government and a debt crisis. And uh, it looks to me like they're just fine with that. So I'm, I, I'm horrified. Judgment, folks, is here. The Ayn Rand curse, you know the Ayn Rand curse? They overregulate everything to the point where gas is $37 a gallon. You know, Atlas Shrugged, which by the way, the sequel, the, the next part of that, the next installment rather, is uh, going to be in the theaters this fall for the election. Um, her predictions have come true. I, I, you know, what can I say? People, well, in, in God's economy, people trade. That's the way that Jesus was part of, uh, of, uh, of that. He, he applied a trade and, and he, you know, for a fair price, he would put a door in for you or a window or something or build some shelves or, you know, build, put a roof on or, you know. In other words, um, that's capitalism. That's a free market. He was free to do that. Yes, I know Caesar had a tax. The point I'm trying to make is that's the way God sets up economy. There's division of labor. There's self-interest, as Adam Smith talked about. Um, and that self-interest, i.e., I want to do something for you that you need done in exchange for a fair wage or, or, or a profit, which I will then use to... Um, Feed my family. I don't have to do everything for you because you have a dentist over there. You've got a bricklayer over here. You've got a, a guy that puts up siding over there. You've got a, you know, you've got a, a massage therapist over here. You've got all these different people who can, you know, through diversified labor, take care of your needs. You pay them. They fulfill the need, you know, and then you do your work. You make your contribution, whatever it is, and then you get paid and then you pay them and then they pay others. And it just goes gangbusters, and that's how the wealth of nations or wealth is created. And, um, you know, if you don't like the price of, for the labor you're offering, uh, then you, you're free not to have to, you're free to look for some other employer. You know, the, the government is not saying to you, you have to work there, you have to get a fair wage, and force the guy to pay you a wage he's not willing to pay and you to stay somewhere you don't want to be, and then the business goes bankrupt. I give you GM is going bankrupt as we speak. Obama bragging that he saved GM. He's trying to hold off the bankruptcy till after the election. He's so cynical, he just, you know, that would be fine for him, you know? They're so anxious to have him back as president because he's, he's transforming the society into a communist society and they're all, you know, coming out of the woodwork now, Hollywood and, and the news media and everything and uh, certain corporations and certain parts of Wall Street, they're all kind of behind the scenes in these secret societies and they're all pushing for, the, for, the, for their glorified dream. This is their dream. They've been working on this for hundreds of years. And so it's very important to them to get this. This is like Damien and the Omen, you know? Uh, the, 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 the Antichrist is here or the Messiah is here, whatever you want to call him, and he's going to take us into the promised land and we've got to make sure he can do that. And so we have to move heaven and earth and lie, cheat and steal, whatever we have to do to get him elected again so we can realize our dream, our collective dream of a, of a utopia where all things are equal and people are happy and everything's harmonious and 
It's just lovely. They're blind to that. This is like some sort of a drug. They're blind. They can't help themselves. And what they don't really realize is they're just pushing us all off the cliff into war and pain and suffering and starvation and all the rest of it that goes with it. You've seen the horrifying pictures. You've seen the concentration camps. You've seen the mass graves. You tell me if that's a pleasant way to live. I'm trying to stop it. I, I, they won't listen. And that is why it's going to come to pass. The churches are being held responsible because they um, were supposed to help to stave this off by getting our nation to repent and to, you know, they're supposed to, you know, have enough believers in this country to help push back this, this ever encroaching crud. And, you know, their prayers are not, are going unheard at this very moment. Their prayers are not being answered with a yes. They're being answered with a no. And that's a sad thing to see. If there was a good church for real, oh, heaven and earth could move in the right way. That would, would benefit people and would be a, a blessing. and People could turn back to God and there would be, you know, there would be that, that harmony and that, that, that uh, um, prosperity and all, and that, and that health of the nation that it's so vital, and that uh, we don't become, you know, worshippers of ourselves or follow. The, you remember how Aleister Crowley uh, died, penniless and sick. Um, a lot of these people follow that philosophy, and so the nation, if they're in charge of the nation, then the nation would die penniless and sick. The Denver Airport murals look, look at the United States and, and look at the, all the nations around the world as penniless and sick with Darth Vader-type overlords over them, creating nothing but misery as far as the eye can see. And then the Denver Airport is then crowned with a Masonic, um, uh, either it's a cornerstone or a headstone or a capstone or whatever it is, a stone there laid in by the Masons, a proud display that they're responsible for those murals. And those murals tell a prophetic picture of a transition from the old way to the new way through violence and plagues that come upon the earth. And at the end of the day, there will be, um, they will have their uh, dream. The witches download um, there are people through bloodlines into the next generation and they do sacrifices and all kinds of things to procure the, the one. You know, just like in the book Dune. Dune kind of told the story of, of, of Satan and really what he was, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and his witches and what they really wanted to bring forth. And they wanted to bring forth this super being who was also a super soldier, sound familiar? Who would lead the people into a new world, a world they could call their own. But it wouldn't come without much pain, suffering, and war. And at long last, it looks like it's within reach because the one has come. He, I forget his name now. What was his name? Anyway, the story of a rich prince and uh, his father was a powerful man and you know, the wars were going on interplanetary. But the, uh, the witches, the Bene Gesserit, they called them, which is interesting. It's like a play on the word Bene Jesuit. You know, they've been cultivating the bloodlines through centuries to produce the Messiah that they would produce through bloodline and genetic manipulation, hence cloning a Messiah who would lead the world into the new order. And as I said, the way they're going with nanomachines and transgenics and everything, 
The new world order is really an order of, it's like the Terminator. It's exactly like that. It's machines and time travel. Very important. And then those machines go back in time and then they freak out like ancient peoples with advanced technology who then worship them as gods. And um, before you know it, uh, the whole line of human history is seen as aliens and things is really just that humanity is ahead of us, we're behind in time. And that they're time traveling back here. We're not caught up to the present. And it's part of the kind of the curse of humanity, if you will, that we're not living in the present time. And this is a something that's kind of like a rima that was put on me that I, I, I understand it from the Bible when you go from, uh, you know, when you finally get to Revelation where there's a new heaven and a new earth, it's sort of like you've caught up with time in, in the judgment part and then we've gone beyond into eternal time, which is what's, uh, which is what's represented with the new heaven and new earth. That it's a, a, a new paradigm, a new dimension, a new... A new um, a way of being, a, 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 you know, a, a different, a uh, whole different cosmological uh, paradigm, uh, dimension, um, a whole new physics. And, but we can't get there because the curse, one of the parts of the curse of humanity is time and space changed in the Garden of Eden. And it became, we became stuck in as I say, past time. So a lot of what we mistake as alien and stuff, it's really humans coming back from a time we haven't reached. It, but it's not linear like that though, it's, it's, it's similar to that. And um, I can't say anymore because it's so amorphous that, uh, that anything I say could be abrogated within by the time I say it. So, so it's like I can't say it because it's obsolete the moment I say it because of this weird configuration of this lockdown prison thing we're in. But, but it's something like that we, we don't live in. And that's how the enemy can be out ahead of you, like you say you're gang stalked. Well, the, and how are, how are they there waiting for you at the corner or in the mall? And there they are waiting and then they jump on you. Because it's like this sort of uh, manipulated by beings behind the scenes, I were ahead in time, also in another dimension, not visible to us, who are manipulating the strings, including putting ideas in your head of where to go that day, and then putting the people there. And they do all this from behind the scenes. And they do it with everyone. The only way out of that is Christ. <laughs> Jesus, when you have a new heart, it means you have a new consciousness, one that can't be manipulated by them, the controllers, or like the Wizard of Oz, just out of sight where you can't see them. Most people are just completely 100% controlled. And they do and they say what they're predicted to say. And they feel that they can just keep us in this state, this lockdown dream state, that uh, they win. If we ever get out, then they lose. God, Yahweh, is going to flip the tables on them through Jesus Christ and um, bring about the end through mega violence and stuff. It's going to represent the end of this whole situation. It's spoken of perfectly in the book of Revelation, and it yields and, and yields to a new heaven and a new earth, which ultimately is Jesus is the power that makes all things new in your life now, eternally, and in the lives of nations, people, things, places. He renews things. So what happened yesterday is no bearing on what's gonna to happen tomorrow. And the way people are to you yesterday doesn't mean they're going to be like that tomorrow. See, you have to keep giving people a chance because what you saw isn't necessarily the truth. I'm hoping that because I see a lot of people that are faking it with Jesus. I'm hoping, you know, I hope yesterday doesn't denote tomorrow that somehow there'll be a change where they get it for real. And I'm assured, I'm assured on high authority that when the hammer comes down on all these all this horrible stuff that's going to be coming down the pike, that we will be uh, renewed and the church will be strengthened at that point and we'll, we'll, we'll come together as long-lost brothers and sisters and we'll just forget about this whole other stuff of what happened in the churches and before that and the throwing out. And the, yeah, they killed the prophets in the old 
churches or synagogues. So, I mean, it can get pretty bad. They would, today, yeah, the church would persecute Jesus and string him up. Absolutely. Absolutely. The church would be the first one to put him on a, on a, on a tree. <laughs> but under persecution, the lines will be drawn. And, and you'll know, you know a lot more clearly who your friends are. And you'll see you've got a lot more people you have something in common with than you thought. But you're not going to see that until things get pretty, pretty bad. I mean, you know, till, till, till there's a, a consequence for being a believer. And at that point, you're going to realize you have a lot more friends than you thought. And I'm hoping a lot of people who are doing, uh, playing footsie with the world, at that point, realize they have no hope in the future with the world. They have no hope that, you know, the world doesn't give anybody anything also. It's, it's, you know, you earn it through, um, you know, what have you done for me lately? You know, you scratch my back, I scratch your back, blah, blah, blah. It's not, not who you know, it's who you. Oh, I'll leave that out. Um, that sort of thing. Quid pro quo, you know. And, and that's what's led us in, into the situation we're in now. That's why I think God makes that requirement that if you really want to be his... You're going to have to agree to take that persecution beginning with the shunning of your own church. I mean, it starts there and family possibly. And, and, but you then are welcomed by others, you know, that you would find um, maybe that's not acceptable to you. You know, I don't know. I know that a lot of these, you know, we've, we've said a lot about the churches, but we really only said one thing. I've only said one thing about them over the years, um, and it's just that there's a legal, there's a legal problem that, that cuts them off, and unless they either come out of it or agree to go um, you know, solo, uh, the, the people, the congregation, ill-served, uh, and those people that were down with the church's policies, um, will burn. And I'd hate to see that. And they don't want to hear this, but they hear it more now than they did before. The message will never change, folks. The message, the truth, uh, will never change. You know, it's, it's, it's a sad, sad thing that everything we see in our society is a veneer, is yet a facade. You know, the church front is supposed to be for Jesus, turns out to be the opposite. It's a conformity trap. You've got, uh, you know, the, the fast food restaurants are poisoning us. The, uh, you know, the government is uh, just there to take your money and leave you dead in the street. The, um, you know what I mean? Like everywhere you go, if you could see behind the, the front, you'd see another trap there waiting to kill you. And you go, oh my God, this place is, how did I come here? How did, how did such a place like Earth now, I look at it and go, how does this place actually exist At about ninety percent, um, you know, out of balance, doesn't don't things come back to equilibrium? The answer is yes, but it's not going to be without a lot of pain. It's going to be with a lot of pain, and and the people who will suffer the most are the ones at the top right now. Those people that have uh, their vested interest in this system are going to be the most disappointed and and the most broke because obviously um, they're going to lose everything. But um, again, it comes down to first seeing the problem, recognizing that um, there's a solution to the problem, and that is Jesus Christ. Obeying him, right? And, and, and that means at times disobeying your, your, what you heretofore called your elder, your pastor, your, your significant other, your family, you know, people that used to be able to influence you. Uh, when Jesus gets a hold of you, it, it, you know, you are the one who is supposed to influence them. And probably once your eyes are open, they're, they're going to consider you a threat and they won't want you around at that point. And, you know, that's the price of discipleship in Christ. That's the price that the truth, you know, you're set free and there are others to join, but they may not be the ones you've been around. So it's a very scary, scary thing 
So most people go to church and they get comfortable in their little covens and their little cubby holes and, and you know, they don't want to rock the boat because, you know, now it works fine. They're acceptable to society, acceptable there. They're, you know, they're, they're, everything's in harmony. They go to the bakery. They can go to the restaurant. They can you know, take their kids to the school. They can drop them off at the church and they can, you know, go get their hair done and they can go do their lawsuit and they can go have their latte and they can... You know, they can uh, function, man, you know? And as all those things, those facades break down, which they're doing as we speak, um, they will have their opportunity to make a decision. And uh, the ones who decide to stay um, with... with, with uh, their dying brethren. They were saying that essentially, I don't want to go with God. I want to stay with you guys. Going with God is scary. I want to stay here where it's comfortable and I have friends. We have, and that's going to be a lot harder to do when, you know, if, when, because, you know, it's, it's in flux. But if, if when the society breaks down further and we do go into a depression. Remember, the first depression was like a crash followed by, um, you know, a recession like we have now. You know, followed by, um, you know, gradual uptick and then followed by another crash, even worse than the first one. Well, we've done the same pattern. We start with a crash gone along, you know, for a while, looked like we were coming out of it, but now we're going down again toward another crash, and uh, the difference is, and if that happens, then it would be a full-blown depression after another crash. Um, people never did get out. Okay, at that point, a lot of these places are going to go out of business, a lot of people are going to be forced out of these churches. And they may give up those delusions. Do they make up the majority of people in America? By all means, no. And this will happen just in time to welcome all the new freaked out people who watched all their fortunes and everything they worked for go out the window. And they will basically band together. You know, there will be a coming together in the spirit. There will be the family of God being able to worship together. And although it may be illegal by then, but at, at that point, um, God will bring his church together to stand in faith and in peace and in, and in love and in solidarity and in forgiveness while the persecutors go at it feeling like if we just get rid of these people and their book, we will be set free and our world will be great. And... Um, Obviously, I guess they're the ones that will be suffering the most. They'll have the most dramatic fall from grace of all time. And once they put all the Christians they want to death, you know, or incarcerate them or whatever they're going to do, ban their book, ban this, ban that, um, they will be conquered by a foreign uh, entity of uh, China, Russia, whatever, and they will have to serve that master. Any questions? Have we covered it sufficiently? Can you believe that I can actually talk two and a half hours without a break and have it semi -co fairly coherent? No, I didn't give a lot of time to. I mean, that, that means I've spoken more than Rush Limbaugh or any of these, or Sean Hannity or any of these, you know, or Mark Levin or the, who are the others? God, that one guy cracked me up, that Mike so and so is a liberal guy, talk show ranting and raving about eating hate chicken. <laughs> now, I've, I've grappled with the, the whole, you know, what the, what the gay thing is a, is a left-wing political movement, is all it is, and it's another, it's another wing of that movement, along with all the others. You know, Occupy Wall Street is a, right out of the DNC. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Tea Party, which they call uh, AstroTurf and stuff, 
it kind of started with um, Rick Santelli voicing the outrage of the people on CNBC. And then what happened is, is all these unaligned groups sort of got together and it's, it's, it's like the people that went down to eat the chicken, they just went, you know, from, they didn't even need any advertising. I think it was Mike Huckabee that mentioned it on his show and then people just went from all over the place. And then we sat in line for 45, 50 minutes, not an hour and I enjoyed that. Well, it's not the best restaurant in the world, but I, you know, I enjoyed seeing, and all the people were so polite and they didn't mind waiting and there was kind of an atmosphere there of uh, solidarity and, you know, in, 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 in being a, a, a Christian, being a Bible-believing Christian is not being hateful, okay? And at the end of the day, that's what I'm going to state. Me believing in the Bible is the, is the, the inerrant word of God, as the uh, inspired word of God. Um, me believing that, okay, is not hate speech. It's not hateful. The Bible teaches forgiveness and peace and, and, not, and non-judgmentalness. But it will not agree with sin. And what it calls a sin, it states it won't go along with it. You know, I mean, and that is the rub. Let's keep it where the issue is. These Christians are not hateful, but, you know, then the next day or a couple of days later, there was the kissing that was supposed to happen, which did not materialize because... Now the gay community and the LBGT community is split. See, they've all aligned together. The LBGT community has aligned themselves with the left feeling that they will get their agenda through and people will not be hateful and they'll be taught in schools. And over time, it'll be, you know, wonderful to be gay and everything will be fine. And it's just like, but is it wonderful to be a heterosexual? Is it wonderful to be here at all? Is it wonderful to be gay and broke with no future? What's wonderful? You see what I mean? See, see, there's the issue. But no, no, no. It's obfuscated by this, this silly situation. Um, and then they're putting all kinds of rumors on conspiracy websites that this, I forget his name, Kathy is his last name, that he is somehow giving money to groups to kill gays in Uganda or, or whatever he's doing or the Exodus uh, outfit or pe because he believes that if, if it goes gay, meaning if it, gay marriage gets through, it will be, the United States will be um, taken out like Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's what he thinks. That's what he believes. So he puts his money where his mouth is. To, to, he believes that's a problem. Believing that the gay issue was the main thing. The main thing in Sodom and Gomorrah very simply, was sorcery. But they, did, they also forced everyone to be gay as well. They forced it. Anyway, whatever you want to think about it is fine. But that's his belief. He believes that that, that would break God's wrath based on his study of the Bible being a, being a Baptist, okay? Being a born-again Baptist guy, that's what he believes. And um, he doesn't hate gay people and Mike Huckabee doesn't hate gay people. I know that, I mean, that's pretty obvious. And I don't hate gay people. And to be accused of that is insane. They're just trying to marginalize me, take away my voice, take away my belief, and eventually make it illegal to be me so that they can feel like they're more comfortable in their skin or whatever it is, when that's got nothing to do with why they're uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable because, you know, because we're all uncomfortable. That's the whole point of Jesus Christ. There is no comfort anywhere but him. Otherwise, we're just going to kill each other. All the perceived enemies that we have, we're going to kill them so we'll be more comfortable. And in the end, we'll kill each other because we still won't be comfortable. I'm not, you know, be comfortable in your own skin. Let your hair down. Be yourself. That is, for me, that doesn't work. I say, be girded up, be on guard. Because the devil who walks around like a roaring lion is seeking those he can devour, seeking those who are not sober, not vigilant. And I know for a fact, you know, that you know, when I go off the track, I, I get just tortured. And I have to get back to God to find some peace.
I know. Humanity won't be happy until it kills itself. I know. That's the human disease we all have. I know. We've had two world wars and many wars before that and even a hundred year war. I know. We've been at war most of my life. It's not the enemy out there. It's us. We're at war with ourselves and each other. And we externalize it to avoid killing ourselves. So I understand that. I wish I could explain that to the gay community, to the LBGT community, and to the Christians both, who want to focus on this, make this gay thing something. It means gay, 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 nothing else but gay. Why? Okay, I'm done. I, I can't solve it. I can't solve it. It's just the human condition, folks. I can't solve it. It's why I have to seek God, because he'll solve it. And I can't, I gotta go with him, because it won't be solved without some massive discomfort. (laughs) And with that, I bid you shalom, shalom. I love you, and I'm praying for you, and I I, I love all of you. And, um, you know, without, regardless of whatever you believe, and uh, including the, 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 um, 501c3 churches and everybody else, I just wish you would listen. You know, but I understand you've got millions of years of scholarship behind your decisions and, and uh, they know far more than I do about the Bible and everything else and you've gone to Israel 50 million times and you're really partnering in the swing of things and some of you are going to really get involved and done all this stuff for the Lord and who am I to tell you anything? I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not telling you something. I'm stating for the record, for the public, for everyone as a witness, the legality of God's commands to us, period. And even in Revelation 18, if you know, come out and be separate from her, the whore of Babylon, the, the church system, whatever you want to call it, so that you're not, vi- so the plagues that are on her won't be visited upon you, meaning it means what it means. And I want to make a prediction. The church, the, the, I'm not calling them, we're the church. But that 501c3 church situation will not change nor repent, nor do they believe at this date that they have anything to repent for at all. Other than, you know, then, and then anything else that if there's a perceived connection or misconnection or whatever it is, it's all, um, you know, they're just sinners also, so it's, you know, so it's, it's, it's uh, got nothing to do with anything. It has nothing to do with any act of the flesh, has nothing to do with any act of will. They're, they're sinners who repent to Jesus and they're fine. There is nothing wrong. Everything is fine and there is no need to repent. They study the Bible Wednesday nights and, and Thursday and Sunday and and every, God likes it and God's happy with them and everything is fine. The idea that the 501c3 means there's a connection to the devil is just like burning rock records or whatever else. It's just stupid. You know, wild, full-blown conspiracy theory and God's not like that. He's not an unforgiving, awful God that would get, take you out on a technicality if you've done everything else right. That is false. That is a false prophet. Reject that guy. Do not listen. Saying that the church system is antichrist. That's ridiculous. We feed the poor. We go to hospitals. We build hospitals. We feed the children. You've got to be kidding me. Give me a break. The churches do a lot of good. And while saying this, I'm also going to say that as far as being connected to the world and therefore prospering as a result, that's not true of all churches. So I guess the rule of thumb is if you can find a poor church, go to that. Because then you got a good chance of hearing, you know, 
participating in something that's going to be fairly real. What I've seen is behind the scenes, unfortunately, and I guess it's kind of tainted my view. You know, had I not seen behind the scenes and what was really going on, which is not what they, the front they put on on Sunday day and night, had I not seen that, um, and in some cases outright black magic and devil worship or something, had I not seen that, maybe I'd have a different view I don't, you know, but the Lord says there's nothing I can do. I'm probably not going to talk about it again. I mean, I've talked about this for 10 years. There's nothing I can do about it. I just find it amazingly ironic that something that says Jesus on it with a cross on the building uh, would be the opposite. I, you know, but, 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 but they'd be doing all the works. I, I just, I, I can't understand. I, but, but yeah, but it makes sense in a way. But no matter how long you call, I know I said I was going to get out of here. Okay, I will. Okay, goodbye.